Hello everyone and welcome. Today we're looking at every single scientist and their experiments in 2025 AP Biology. This is meant to be watched in conjunction with the video on the diseases. It will give you a really, really good foundation before the exam. Let's get started. First, the Hershey and Chase experiment. What did they actually do? A lot of people misunderstand this one. Basically, at this point in time, they did not know if the genetic material was DNA or protein. It seems obvious now, but they just didn't know. At one point, someone had to find out. So what did they do? They used bacteriophages. Bacteriophages, okay, are viruses which put their DNA inside cells. This is very important to understand this experiment. They don't enter the cell. Only their DNA goes into the cell. Of course, at this point in time, they didn't know whether it was DNA. They just knew that it was the genetic material that entered the cell. So to find out whether it was DNA or protein, what they did is they made two bacteriophages. One of them had radioactive sulfur. It being radioactive is just a way to track it, by the way. Um, only proteins have sulfur, DNA does not. The other bacteriophage they made was uh, radioactive and phosphorus. Why? Because only DNA has phosphorus and protein does not. So it was a, basically a way to distinguish between the two different compounds, DNA and protein. They then let the bacteriophages put the genetic material inside the cell and then they blended it up. And when you put that in a test tube, the cells go in the pellet, so the very, very bottom. So if we knew that the genetic material went into the cells and that's going to be in the pellet, it's simply a matter of looking at what radioactive compound we have in the pellet and that will tell us whether the genetic material is protein or DNA. I hope that logic follows. If you don't understand it, put it in the comments, I'll give a better explanation. But basically, they did it with sulfur, as you can see, and there was nothing in the pellet. The sulfur was in the supernates and basically the liquid above, not in the cells. So the protein had not been put into the cells by the bacteriophage. But then when they did it with the phosphorus, the pellet did indeed contain radioactive phosphorus, meaning the DNA had entered the cells. Okay, so the genetic material was DNA, because again, we know the genetic material was inserted by the bacteriophages. So that is the Hershey and Chase experiment. The next thing is Chargaff. Chargaff, I'm probably mispronouncing that, was a scientist who did a discovery in basically DNA and the genetic material as well. As well. So before Chargaff, what we thought is that DNA was the same sequence of bases over and over. So ATCG, 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 and so on and so on and so on. If this were true, it would mean that we would have all the bases in the same number, right? Because it's a repeating sequence. So we would have 25% of each in the entirety of DNA, right? That was called, very importantly, this is the keyword, the tetranucleotide hypothesis. This is what they'll ask you about in the past papers, right? But what Chargaff did is he basically looked at sequences of DNA in different organisms, as you can see in the table, and he realized it wasn't like a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. Instead, there were more quantities of some bases than others. So what he did is he falsified, he disproved the tetranucleotide hypothesis. Simple as that. Don't overcomplicate it. That is what Chargaff did. The next thing is the Miller-Urey experiment. This one, again, can seem kind of complicated, but it's not. This basically wanted to find out how did the first carbon compounds on Earth get formed, because carbon compounds, as we know, are essential for life, right? We are made of carbon compounds, but how did they start? Because in other planets, they don't exist. So what Miller and Yuri did is they set up this whole flask system, you can see with tons of things, but you don't need to remember that many things. What you need to remember is that they simulated the prebiotic atmosphere, meaning the atmosphere before there was life. So they put gases in that were there before prebiotic life. They put water vapor in as well. And they also had electrical sparks uh, going in to simulate lightning because it's thought that in the prebiotic atmosphere, there was a lot more lightning than nowadays. So once they did this simulation, they let the flask set for a couple of days. And then they realized that carbon compounds did form spontaneously. They saw 20 different amino acids. So this was proof that without any interference, any human interference, any sort of trick, this flask was able to produce carbon compounds in a similar manner to how the atmosphere before life might have done it. So it doesn't prove that that was the way it happened, but it shows that it is possible. So that is the take home message, okay? It's that carbon compounds can form spontaneously. Next up is Linnaeus. There you can see him. This one is super, super simple to understand. He was just basically a pioneer in taxonomy. So 
he started a lot of the classification systems that we now use, like the genus and species. But most importantly, what you need to remember is that Linnaeus, the classification he used for species, was based on morphology, right? They looked at the outside of the animal or plant and the inside as well, but basically they only looked at the structure. They didn't look at the genes, they didn't have the technology for that. It was very, very simplistic. This is not how we do things now. Just understand that this is how they started off classifying species, and that is why we've had to reclassify a lot of species because it was based on the wrong thing. Next up, we have Darwin versus Lamarck. So this is quite simple to understand again. Lamarck founded Lamarckism, right? Which is the thought of acquired characteristics get passed on to your progeny. So for example, here we have Carlos Algaras, a tennis player. His right arm is much bigger than his left arm because he plays tennis. That does not mean that his baby would have a larger right arm than his left arm, right? That doesn't make any sense. But they didn't know that at the time, so that's what Lamarck thought. He thought that acquired characteristics would get passed on to progeny. Then Darwin, he proposed that no, only heritable characteristics can get passed on to progeny. And this was a sort of revolution, right? It disproved Lamarckism. Simple as that. You don't need to remember anything else. Then we have the Bohr shift. The Bohr shift can be quite hard to understand. It basically means that when there's high concentrations of CO2, hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen. Why? The textbook does a horrible job at explaining this. It's basically because when you have super high CO2, it means that cells have been doing a lot of respiration. So they need more oxygen. Therefore, you need oxygen to dissociate from hemoglobin, from red blood cells, so that it will actually go into cells. Okay? It's as simple as that. So how does this happen? There's lower affinity for oxygen by hemoglobin. It's called the Bohr shift. It's two different things. First of all, when CO2, so there's very high CO2, right? It's mixed with water and blood is a lot, is mainly water, right? It's going to produce protons and HCO3. So this basically lowers the blood pH. And all you need to know is that a lower blood pH reduces the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen. And then the second part to the Bohr shift is that um, CO2 can actually interact with the sites on hemoglobin that bind to oxygen, and it can make it into what we call carbaminohemoglobin, right? So it can go from hemoglobin to carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin has, again, a lower affinity for oxygen. So these two things make up the Bohr shift, and they allow for cells to get more oxygen when they need it the most. Next up, we have the Lincoln Index. What do we use it for? It is to estimate population size. More specifically, we use it when we do the capture, mark, recapture, release, recapture model. Sorry, it's a really a mouthful. So in this model, we capture some animals, a sample, we then mark them where they're not visible, we then release them again, and then we recapture another sample and count the marked ones. Once we've done that, we then use the Lincoln Index to estimate the population size. So it's basically just a formula, <laughs> okay? There's not much more to it. So according to the Lincoln Index, the population size is going to be M times N over R. So M is the number of marked individuals, so the sample you took. N is the number of individuals you recaptured. And then R is the number of individuals you recaptured which had a mark. When you do this, you basically get an estimate for the population size. There's a lot of assumptions in place here, though, so it's not a foolproof method. Then we have the Keeling curve. So Keeling was an American who basically did a lot of measurements on CO2 in the atmosphere for years, since 1959. So he's allowed us to get this curve showing how CO2 has progressed over time. And there's two main takeaways from this that you need to remember. The first is that there is a seasonal aspect to this curve, right? Um, so there's annual uh, fluctuations. And that is because there's an imbalance globally between the hemispheres in terms of the rates of respiration and photosynthesis. So that's why every year we see that fluctuation. But then the second one, and the most worrying one, is a long-term trend upwards. Why is that? Because of human interference. So fossil fuel burning, deforestation, etc. And that's increased the level of CO2 in the atmosphere very, very dramatically over the years. Now we have Endler's guppies. So John Endler was a scientist, he did this experiment. Basically, he put guppies, a type of fish, in two different um, containers. In one of them, there were no predators. In another one, there were predators. 
What happened? When there were no predators, the guppies developed very, very striking colors, as you can see. Why? Because it gave them an advantage when mating. They were more attractive. However, when there were predators, they became duller. They didn't get those colors. Why? Because the colors made them more visible to the predators. So this goes to show that the environment determines the selective pressures. If you're about to be eaten, then you prioritize for survival, right? So that's where natural selection goes towards survival. If, however, there's no predators, natural selection will lead you towards um, higher, chan higher chances of mating, basically. So again, it just shows that selective pressures are different depending on your environment. And finally, we have the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Again, a lot of students get confused by this. It's actually quite simple. So it's used to calculate um, the genotype frequencies or allo frequencies in the population. Now, again, this is super simplistic. It assumes there's no evolution, which is not true. So it doesn't work in real life, but it's an oversimplification um, just for IP. So the formula goes as follows. It's P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So P squared is um, the homozygous dominant. Why? Because it means that the individual has two Ps, right? P squared. 2PQ is the heterozygous. It means um, it, he ha like the organism has one allele of each. And Q squared is the homozygous recessive, right? So the organism has two uh, recessive alleles, so Q squared. So this can be used to determine um, frequencies in a very simple example. So for example, if you have pea plants, and let's say that pea plants can have two different colors, right, for the peas. Yellow, um, and yellow is dominant, so yellow is going to be PP or PQ. And then you have green, which is QQ. If you assume that there, or they tell us, for example, that 25% of peas are green, then we know that 0 0.25 is Q squared, right? Because again, Q squared is the homozygous recessive. It's the probability of having two Qs, Q times Q. So if you know that, then you can figure out that Q is 0 0.5, right? The square root of 0 0.25. Then you can figure out all the rest of the probabilities because you know that the, the P plus Q is one, right? Because there's no other allele. So the probability of having P plus Q has to be one. Therefore, P must be 0 0.5 as well. And from there, you can figure out the probability of being a homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So again, any questions about this, leave them in the comments because I know there's a lot of confusion, but it's actually just not, don't overthink it. It's not too difficult. It is just to make estimations. Okay, and this is the final scientist in IV biology. Again, anything, leave it in the comments and good luck everyone.